Okay, good evening. How are we doing? Good. Everyone survived the flood? So far, so far. All right. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Okay. We need a bigger boat. Someone was listening to the homily this morning. Yes, good job. All right, let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Jesus went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending your son Jesus to proclaim good news to us, to the poor the poor in spirit, the poor in heart, the lowly. Father, we thank you for sending your son to the lowest place, to the place of our sin and our emptiness and our brokenness so that we can be raised up, redeemed, healed, and restored. Father, we ask you to send the same spirit that was upon your son upon us tonight ask you to open up our hearts to your goodness, to your love, and especially to bless all of our ears and my mouth that we may only speak and hear your goodness. We ask this in the name of Jesus, your Son, and our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Well, it's so good to be back together after celebrating uh, Christmas and New Year's and part three of our evangelization series here at St. Bernadette. And you're not following me. That's sad. Hold on. Let's see what we can do here. Okay, so um, I'm going to do a little bit of a recap first on where we've been. So the first two nights of the series, um, just so we can all kind of get caught up and check in on our homework that I gave last time. Um, so the first night we talked about relationship with Jesus, and we talked about primarily how important it is if we're going to enter into evangelization and be evangelizers, meaning if we're going to tell people about Jesus and share Jesus and his our relationship with him we need to have a relationship right and so we talked about this rim rim relationship identity mission and how it's so important for us to live out of our relationship with god first and then realize that from our relationship with god we have an identity as beloved sons and daughters and then from that identity we're called to go out on mission which is to proclaim the gospel with our lives. So relationship, identity, mission, and how sometimes as human beings and as Christians, it can be, the trap can be for us to fall into the opposite of that, to live out of a mission 
and then our identity is formed by our mission, and then our relationship with God we base on how our mission turns out, which, as we know, could be pretty terrible because we fail at our mission quite often because we're sinners. But God doesn't call us to live that way, thankfully. He calls us his beloved sons and daughters. So no matter what we do with our mission, he's just loving on us. We talked a little bit about A-R-R-R prayer, the pirate's prayer. Arr. Uh, and we talked about how we acknowledge, relate, receive, and respond in prayer. So we acknowledge where we're at. We relate that to the Father. We receive from him. And then we respond to that. So it's a simple form of prayer and relationship uh, with the Lord. And we particularly talked about hearing God's voice. Um, so I gave a couple different examples of how we can, uh, you know, simply say, Lord, do you love me? And listen for that voice in our mind that we oftentimes think can sound like ourselves, but God can use that because he created our mind, our intellect, our will. He created everything. So he can use all of that to reach us and to speak to us. So that was the first session. The second session was being able to talk to people about Jesus because once we realize we have a relationship then we have to open ourselves up to being able to talk to him or talk to other people about him to share that relationship that we have with him by and follow the command that God gave us to go out and proclaim the gospel with our lives we talked about really the importance of love if you remember I asked the question what is love baby don't hurt me right and love was willing the good of the other and that good being relationship with God or union with God. So the, the ultimate end for us is to love other people, which means helping them to experience union with Jesus. And we talked about the importance of our story in being able to talk about that. So realizing that all of us have had encounters, hopefully, with God. And if we haven't, then that's where the homework comes in, right? So I asked everybody who was here, to reflect on a moment where they knew they were loved by God and to just remember the power of that moment, the authority of that moment over your life, and to realize that when we're loved by God, we're not loved because of anything that we've done or because of anything that we've been able to, or any expectations that we've been able to meet, but simply because we're his, because he created us out of love simply for love's sake. On the other end of the homework, I also asked if, if you had never experienced God's real love for you, um, for you to reflect on something that stops you from knowing God's love for you. And tonight I think it'll become a little more apparent why I asked that question. Um, and if you find yourself in that place, first of all, it's not your fault. Second of all, God wants to reveal his love to you. So hopefully over the course of tonight and then even some of the next sessions, um, you might be able to experience that love for you if you've never experienced it before. I also remember um, I gave you a quote on that second night, and it was basically this, that we only have authority over that which we love. And I changed that quote to, we only have authority over the one whom we love. And it's not that we have the ability to like, you know, go make me a sandwich kind of authority, but it's more of if we want people to know Jesus, the only way that we can truly get them along that path is if we love them first. We can't beat them over the head with a Bible or tell them that the catechism in paragraph 2536 says X, Y, or Z. The only way that we can really hope to change hearts along with the Holy Spirit in union with the Holy Spirit is by first loving. So that's kind of where we've been, starting with relationship ourselves and then being willing to talk about and share that relationship with others. And I know there were many questions about you know, how do I talk to a family member in particular who maybe doesn't want anything to do with God? And we're going to get to that. Tonight's not that night, but we are going to get to that in the course of this series. So tonight we're going to focus on inner healing and to kind of give you a sense of a differentiation between like inner healing versus what other kind of healing. Um, there are all kinds of categories for healing. I like to break it down to basically inner and physical. At the moment, I don't have a specific physical healing night in the series. However, the Holy Spirit in the last couple of days has been leading me down that road. So I think we're going to incorporate that at some point, which would be a lot of fun. So we'll actually get to see God like do some real physical healing, which would be sweet. But for now, for tonight, we're going to talk about inner healing. And this kind of falls into different categories, such as emotional healing, spiritual healing, 
mental healing. There's all kinds of different stuff that we can talk about here, and I'm going to break some of this open. But we have to start with Jesus' mission, okay? And a lot of times, I think we think of Jesus as many different things. We could think of him as a savior, as a healer, as a really good guy that taught a lot of good things, um, as a pretty good moral person. Um, he falls under a lot of different umbrellas. But one of the titles that I think kind of catches everything is healer. And here's why. If you think about Jesus at his fundamental, who he was, he was the second person of the Trinity who was sent down from heaven to earth by his Father to ultimately restore the broken relationship that each and every one of us had that we had received because of the first sin of Adam and Eve, right? So at the beginning of time, at the beginning of creation, we were in a beautiful concert-like relationship with the Father, and there was just this beautiful flow of grace, and we were in union, and the garden was beautiful, and the animals were kind, and there was no suffering, and every, like it was this beautiful, beautiful vision of what it meant to exist, right? And then sin came in, and God had to do something about that. So that's kind of our situation, right? We find ourselves in a broken world, and prior to Jesus coming onto the scene, we are really like toast. Like, there was no out for us. Once you died, you had no hope of, like, really anything after that. We kind of talk about different options like limbo or the Jews had a different belief of where you would end up. It was just, there was not hope for after death. We were kind of sunk, right? And so tonight we're going to talk about how Jesus' mission affects our situation, in particular for inner healing. So how God sending his son to earth can have a direct impact on our daily lives every single day, right? And then at the end, I'm gonna do an activation and it's going to be an easy, light introduction to this whole world because we could be here for weeks talking about all this. Um, but I just wanna give you a taste of it and then I'll give you some resources to dig into after that. Okay, so Jesus's mission. As I kind of said, um, this all starts because Jesus wants to restore us to relationship with the Father. And it began with the fall, with Adam and Eve. And then after that fall, we find ourselves in the Old Testament stories with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and turning to Israel and then Moses and like everything that goes into all that, right? The whole Old Testament narrative. So after the fall, we, end up, we find ourselves in that situation until, as the prophets foretold, the incarnation occurs. The God man actually makes himself present and he comes among us to live with us and to show us what it means to live as if the kingdom of God is actually at hand. And I'll get at that in a second. But we got to look at Jesus' whole trajectory in terms of his revelation or God's way of showing us who he is, okay? So the fall occurs, Adam and Eve sin. Then we get to the incarnation. Jesus comes down among us. He goes to the cross to show us what true love looks like, to lay his life down for each and every one of us, to not just you know, give himself to us, but to show us that what we are made for is actually redeemable. The sin of Adam and Eve, the sin that led to no hope, to no out, to no way of dealing with any of that, it was redeemable by his body and his blood given for us on the cross. From the cross, he actually descends into hell. We pray that every week in the creed, right? He descends into hell to defeat Satan and the power of death and evil, to destroy all of that. So you kind of get this amazing image of Jesus who starts off with the Father in heaven. He comes down to earth in the incarnation. He ascends to the cross, but in ascending to the cross, he descends into this low like place, just the worst place possible criminal punishment you could experience. And that still wasn't low enough for him. Then he descended all the way into hell to defeat the power of sin and death. But from there, he rises uh, in the resurrection, and then he ascends back to his father to where he starts. You see there's this whole motion of Jesus who's kind of coming down in a rescue mission to save us and then bring us back to the father. So he, in the ascension, 
I didn't really appreciate the ascension until a couple of years ago. He goes back to the Father so he could be seated there to intercede on our behalf, to say, like, Father, I want you to take care of these kids down here. Like, all these people who I went to save, I want you to take care of them. That's what he's doing when he's seated at the right hand of the Father. And the Father's like, okay, let's do it. And so what does he do? But he sends the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And you might have heard me talk about this before in terms of who God is. But this is incredible. God is a loving Father. And a loving father must give himself away in love, right? So he gives himself to his son. The son receives that love, and he must also love because true love is creative. It manifests stuff, right? So he gives himself back to the father. And within this awesome creation, anytime there's love that's real, it's creative. It's procreative. Something protrudes from it. And so that's where we get the Holy Spirit, the love of the father and the son, this beautiful spirit that is sent down to us. And so at Pentecost, the father and the son are like, all right, we got to send our, our love and our life down to help our kids. And so they send the Holy Spirit upon us, who then lives among us, the same spirit that lived among Jesus in our opening prayer, the same spirit who he said, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news. This is good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, that's healing, to set the oppressed free, that's inner healing right there, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So hopefully you can see here, between the opening prayer that we prayed, between what's going on with Jesus, this mission of descending down to the lowest place to destroy sin and death, and then to bring us back to the Father, this is Jesus' mission. All right. And so we want to tap into that mission. And when Jesus says the kingdom of God is at hand, this is what he's talking about. When he when Jesus comes down to earth, it's not as if like there's this heavenly dude that is here among us and we're all still the sinners. He's bringing the kingdom down with him so that we exist within it and so that we can participate in it and so that it is right here within our grasp. All right. So the question is, for us on a practical level who don't have the Jesus walking right here next to us, how does that work? How is it that the kingdom of God is at hand, the kingdom of God that is so pervasive in our world, and yet we still don't necessarily see it? Well, we have to start with Scripture. And we have to start with the way um, that Jesus interacted with the world when he was walking on the world. And now, I do want to acknowledge, too, I know the Eucharist, and I know that Jesus is present here among us, like 500 yards that way. Like, I know he's over there, right? But there is a difference between the Jesus that was walking right here and how, they, how the apostles would have interacted with him and how we interact with him now. I, I get the human element to that. But he's still here. And so we got to look at the way he interacted with different people when he was walking around on the face of the earth. So the first one is the woman at the well. And if you know the story of the woman at the well, um, the basics of it are this. This was a woman who had um, kind of prostituted herself out, had been with many different husbands, right? And Jesus encounters her, and she's at this well looking for water so that she could drink it and do whatever she needed to do with the water. And Jesus meets her and he says, you know, I, I can give you living water. And it totally goes over her head what he's talking about until he looks at her and he says, listen, I know what you've done. I know where you've been. I know what your heart experiences. I know the pain you feel. I know everything about you. And I want to offer you the solution. I want to offer you the redemption. And what ends up happening is because Jesus speaks to her and speaks into her life and says, I know where you've been. I know what's happened. She's completely overwhelmed and realizes who he is. Her eyes are open, and she experiences this immense inner freedom, this immense inner healing to say, like, okay, I don't have to live as a slave to the old mindset anymore. I don't have to live as a slave to even the, the way that other people view me or the way other people think about me because of what I've done, because my identity rests in what he thinks of me and what Jesus views me as. So there's this beautiful inner healing that takes place in that story. We get the thief on the cross who obviously is in a pretty physically terrible spot, right? Jesus is being crucified on the cross, and he's with two um, criminals on either side. you got the one who's just completely closed off to any possibility of relationship with Jesus. But then there's the one on the other side who realizes who Jesus is, who realizes he's done absolutely nothing wrong. 
but he finds himself as a criminal realizing, yeah, I actually deserve this. Like what I did was worthy of this punishment. And he turns to Jesus and he says, Lord, just remember me when you come into your kingdom. And it's this act of humility. And Jesus is able to look at him and say, my son, today you will be with me in paradise. He sees what he's done. He sees the brokenness that has existed within him. He sees the, the regret and the pain. And he says, I forgive you of that. Today you will be with me. So we see another example of Jesus healing what's going on inside. Not a physical healing, right? So he's still there on the cross, but an inner healing that allows him to experience eternal, everlasting life. The healing of the paralytic. Um, this beautiful story of um, Jesus who's in a home and he's totally surrounded by so many people and these men bring their friend who's paralyzed and they want to have Jesus heal him, but they can't get into the house. They literally climb up onto the roof and the gospel says that they beat the house roof in so that they can lower him into the house, right? And what does Jesus do? He looks at him and he says, your sins are forgiven. It's a weird reaction, a weird response. You get this guy who's totally laid out on a bed and can't move, has never been able to move his entire life. And Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. Because Jesus knows that at our core, in our hearts, a lot of times, the stuff that needs inner healing is a lot more painful than the physical healing. I don't want to say it's always the case because I've had some pretty horrible physical pain. But he knows that in the long run, it's the inner stuff that really needs to be redeemed, to be restored, to be healed. And then, of course, the famous story of Mary Magdalene. And if you've ever seen The Chosen, you've actually seen three out of four of these played out on the big screen, right? Uh, but Mary's story is so beautiful. This woman who had fallen so far away from her identity that she even experienced a name change. It's funny because in, in the Old Testament, we see lots of name changes. We see Abram become Abraham. We see um, Jacob become Israel. We see, you could count them off on your hand. It's pretty rare that we see someone who had a good name and because of what they fell into, they receive a new bad name. But it's that change in identity and we see that with Mary. But it's Jesus who comes onto the scene and redeems her and says, where you've been and what you've done, I don't care. I love you anyway. He literally descends to her lowest place so that he could bring her back up, all right? So we see over and over again, Jesus meeting hearts and souls where they're at and not condemning, not judging, not putting them down, but saying, I see you for where you are. I see you for who you are. And I just want to give you my heart. I just want to give you my love. How many of you think that's a pretty different view of Jesus than what the world has to offer? Yeah. Um, yeah, you know. All right. So our situation. All of us have experiences, relationships, or past events that have caused our hearts to be wounded. I want to tell you about the word shalom, okay? It's a Hebrew word. You obviously know it probably means peace, right? There's actually a much deeper meaning to the word shalom. At its root, at its Hebrew roots, it literally means be made whole. Okay, be made whole. And the reason the word is described that way actually harkens back to what you see here, this broken heart. That shalom... It doesn't just mean like a piece that you're like, okay, I'm not feeling anxious right now, but it means a fundamental restoration and healing at the core of who you are. And any time that Jesus says, my peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, he's saying shalom. Not just, you know, feel good right now, don't deal with the anxiety right now, but be made whole, be restored to the glory that your Father desires for you, that he's given you. Okay, so all of us have experiences, relationships, past events that have wounded us and caused us to not be in that shalom anymore, right? But we don't have to stay there. And that's the good news about the message tonight that I hope to share with you, that all of us have experienced the wounds from teachers, friends, parents, boyfriends, girlfriends, politicians, church authority, I'm thinking priests here, bishops, um, work-related events, school-related events, sports-related events. 
There's all these different things in our lives that a lot of them are really good, and a lot of them bring about really good things, but because sin exists in the world, because, because we're at times kind of selfish and kind of self-focused and self-centered, we don't find ourselves loving and willing the good of the other, and so then we find ourselves either experiencing the effects of that self-centeredness from another person, or ourselves, when we are self-centered and inward on ourselves because we're hurting, find ourselves hurting other people. My mom, who's here tonight, has a great line, and she says, hurt people hurt people. It's never the case that a shalom person hurts people because they're made whole. And so she's got the line, hurt people hurt people. A few years ago, I decided that I had a line to go along with it, and it's healed people heal people okay so jesus wants to give us healing not just for ourselves but so that we too can bring his healing to the whole world who as i always say so desperately needs it so how does jesus's mission affect our situation as i explained in this whole descent and then ascent of jesus from the father all the way down to hell and all the way back to the father at the ascension once he's back with his father, the whole like church mission, full blow, get going, make it happen, begins. And it begins by Jesus sending the Holy Spirit to keep the mission alive. Because without the Holy Spirit, there wouldn't be a church. Without the Holy Spirit, um, we wouldn't be able to continue to celebrate even the sacraments the way that we do. There'd be no opportunity for an epiclesis, for Eucharist. There'd be no forgiveness of sins because priests wouldn't receive the Holy Spirit at their ordination. There wouldn't be a sacrament of marriage that could point us to this relationship. Like, none of this would exist. So, when Jesus goes back to the Father, they rub their hands together and say, alright, let's do this. We're getting going right now. Holy Spirit, go. Right? In the midst of all of that, before he even goes to his crucifixion, Jesus tells his apostles in John 14, 12, he had just done a whole bunch of miracles, and he says to them, you will do greater works than these. And he's not just speaking in reference to a few miracles in that passage. The way the gospel is written and the way the language is written, he is speaking in reference to every miracle that is ever recorded that he performed. He's saying, you, my followers, and your descendants and all them, are going to perform greater miracles than I even performed. And Jesus raised people from the dead. So I don't know how we could get much greater than that, but I believe we can. So... In other words, he wants us to keep healing and keep setting captives free. Think Isaiah again. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He's anointed me to set the oppressed or the captives free. Now, I want to pause and just say, too, what we're talking about here is not an exorcism because that's a question that can quickly come up. Um, if we're talking about, like, inner healing and spiritual healing it could quickly get into this like well am i possessed by a devil or an enemy or something that's not what this is about this is about the mere fact that it is the case that we believe as catholics that there is a holy spirit right who is active and at work in our life and because there's a holy spirit there also has to be an unholy spirit right and we believe that there are unholy spirits that try to throw us off, that try to get into the way of us living our holy Catholic Christian lives. Um, and it's our job to focus on the Holy Spirit. So you see in this last bullet point I have, it's not about exercising demons. It's rather about inviting the Holy Spirit to pour the love of the Father into our broken, wounded hearts so that we can experience shalom and be made whole, to experience the peace of God. And so rather than thinking about like, okay, I got to deal with all the brokenness in my life. I got to be able to name this or that or why X, Y, or Z has happened to me. It's not about that. It's about exposing ourselves to the love of a father in heaven who so greatly desires to heal us, to restore us, to give us his peace, and to just let him lead us on that journey. So I want to give you just a couple of key tools for inner healing. And I'm stealing these from a book called Unbound. I'm pretty sure I might have recommended it at the first session. Um, it's a book, yeah, I, I have it on the book list at the end. Um, but it's called Unbound by Neil Lozano. And it's a five-step prayer model for inner healing. 
and it's pretty good. I have a couple of, you know, kinks in it that I think could be worked out that would make it really good. Um, but where it's at is Neil talks about how there's five steps to achieving real, total inner healing. This is not something that's like one and done either. Like it's something that you can do every single day. And I can tell you from experience, I do do it every day. The first step that he talks about is repentance. So turning to the Father and acknowledging, I'm broken, I'm a sinner. It's like you talk about AA. The first step in AA is admitting that you got a problem, right? And the first step in recovering from our sinful nature is admitting, yeah, there's a problem that I was born with. This isn't something that I decided to have, this sin, sickness, something that is just part of who I am. So repenting and turning to the Father. The second step is forgiveness, okay? The biggest block to inner healing that any of us could experience at any time is unforgiveness. The reason being is this. If some, actually I've talked about this before, the difference between forgiveness and reconciliation, all right? Reconciliation would be like if me and my mom got in a fight and um, we needed to talk it over and be able to come to some resolution between the two of us and be good, like that's reconciliation. It's a two-sided event. Um, where we come from, okay, we're not getting along, to okay, now we're getting along. As opposed to forgiveness, which can happen whether you have contact with the person or not. It's you sitting there and just saying with Jesus, in the name of Jesus, I forgive, let's say, Jack. I forgive Jack for causing me harm 30 years ago, for whatever that is. What that is saying is saying, what Jack did to me was wrong. There's no doubt about it. I'm not saying that it's okay what Jack did to me, but what I am saying is that it no longer has power over me. The way Jack treated me, the way he um, had done whatever he did to me, no longer has authority over my life. And I wanna give you maybe just a small example of this. When I was in, well, I won't tell you where I was, but I was in school at one point, and I had someone over me um, who was kind of like a supervisor. And they really mistreated me, like horribly. And for years after that, I was extremely bitter about that. And any time that anyone would treat me remotely the way that that person did, I would experience all kinds of emotions and feelings inside. And oftentimes I would lash out at that person because I was being triggered or brought back to that original mistreatment. Right. What ended up happening was I was introduced to this model of inner healing and I experienced like, okay, I gotta forgive this person because if I, if I don't, then I'm just letting them kind of rule my mind, rule my head, rule my reactions. And so in Jesus' name, I forgave Jack, I forgave him for the way he treated me, for the things that he did wrong to me. And I gotta tell you, like the experience of freedom after that was unbelievable. Now, I've, I've forgiven other people before and not experienced that same change like so quickly, but with Jack, it was like the next morning I woke up and it just didn't have power over me anymore. It was a beautiful, beautiful reality, and it was a deep spiritual inner healing that Jesus led me to. Um, so unforgiveness is a big one, and again, this happens a lot of times um, either with parents, with teachers, with coaches, with people who have authority over us and mistreated us in some way. I even wrote to God. Like sometimes we have to forgive God for allowing certain things to happen. Like there's events in my life that I wish had never happened, I wish he had never allowed, and I actually got angry at him. And so I forgave him. Obviously God didn't do anything wrong. God permits all things for the good for those who love him. But sometimes in our broken humanity, we have to forgive him as a way of releasing whatever we perceive to be the issue that was caused. So repentance, forgiveness, Renunciation, this is a big one too. So a lot of times I talked about, we've got the Holy Spirit and then we got unholy spirits. And there are all kinds of unholy spirits. But the good news for us is that the Holy Spirit just like destroys every unholy spirit. And so the way we deal with them is simply renouncing them in Jesus' name. Because Jesus' name has power. Like when I say it every single time, the, the heavens are ripped open and the power of God just descends into this room because Jesus' name itself has unbelievable power. So when we renounce, say, the lie, um, you say, the lie that I'm not good enough, I renounce that in Jesus' name. That has power. 
Jesus, Jesus enters into that lie and just swipes it to the side, kind of like a picture on, I don't know. I'm not good at social media. Um, but Jesus just like wipes it out, right? Um, and then there's spirits. Like you could talk about the spirit of anxiety or the spirit of depression or the spirit of fear or the spirit of loneliness. Renouncing those spirits and saying, in the name of Jesus, spirit of fear, I want nothing to do with you. Be gone right now. You have no power over me in Jesus' name. So you see there's this movement from repentance, so turning away um, from our sin and turning towards Jesus, forgiveness, forgiving those who've hurt us, harmed us, renouncing any lies or spirits that might have like gotten a foothold on us in some way. And then the fourth step is to command them out, to command that they be gone in Jesus' name to the foot of the cross to be dealt with by his body and blood. And then the last step, which think of it this way. If you've got a wound that's been like infected, you go into the hospital to get it all cleaned out. That's like the first four steps. It's cleaning out the wound, acknowledging what's there, and making sure it's all cleared. And then you pour some kind of like oil or ointment into it, right, to anoint it. That's what the Father's blessing is. It's saying, okay, this spot in your heart that was hurt and broken and wounded and like kind of icky, like we're going to pour something beautiful into it now to heal, to restore, to bring new life. And again, you see this happen all throughout the gospel in all the healing stories of Jesus. Even to just think of the, the thief, right? The thief who repented. Um, he forgave himself almost in a sense by saying like, yeah, I fell short of what I was supposed to be doing here. And I'm just going to say that's enough. I'm going to turn to Jesus renouncing his past life and saying, I want nothing to do with that anymore. And then receiving the Father's blessing through Jesus, who shows us the face of the Father, right? And Jesus saying, today you'll be with me in paradise. Like, that's what it is right there. So, that being said, any questions about any of that? That's exactly right, yeah. And what's beautiful about it, too, is that um, the sacrament of confession is the formal way that God gives us to enter into this inner healing. Every time we go to God with this stuff, he literally not just forgives us, but he pours new grace into our hearts, kind of like that Father's blessing, right? Um, so that we can live out of that freedom rather than out of a spirit of fear or um, self What's the word I'm looking for? Self-accusation, right? It just wipes it all out and says, you are mine and I choose you and love you. Any other questions? Does it seem to make some sense? Maybe just... Okay, good. All right, so we're going to do an activation. Um, special shout out to my sister for helping me nail down how I was going to do this. She's not here, but you're going to hear from her in the coming weeks. <clears throat> so what we're going to do is this. We're going to ask Jesus to lead us through a little mini healing session here, all right? Now, it's important to note that we never want to try to do this ourselves in the sense that we never want to go digging for the roots or for what is causing us discomfort, right? So, like, say you find yourself really dealing with anxiety. Obviously, you're going you're gonna to seek out, all right, what's causing this anxiety right now? But you want to deal with a specialist who can help you deal with anxiety. And the best specialist of our hearts and of our souls is Jesus himself. And so we're going to ask Jesus to kind of lead us through this Emmanuel moment activation. All right. Also, you want Jesus to be the one who does all the work. So this is going to be a dialogue between you and him. Um, and I'm not going to ask you to tell me what you go through. Um, I might ask if you experienced anything just so I get some feedback and I can be able to adjust how I teach this in the future. But um, we're just going to do it and see what happens, okay? So this is Ignatian imaginative prayer with Jesus kind of leading the way. So here's what I want you to do. Let's begin in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I want you to call to mind somewhere safe somewhere really peaceful, 
somewhere really like you just know that you belong there. You keep that in your mind's eye, or you can gaze upon Jesus on this image on the screen, whatever helps you to focus the best. Now, if you're there, I want you to notice what it looks like, what it feels like, what it smells like. Maybe it's a restaurant, what it tastes like. What it sounds like. Okay, next what I want you to do is I want you to invite Jesus into that place. So maybe it's your bedroom, maybe it's your church, maybe it's your living room. Invite Jesus there. Just imagine that he's sitting there with you, maybe he's staring, like gazing at you, maybe he's just hanging out with you there. And in this moment of encounter, I want you to notice yourself. I want you to notice how old you are. Notice even what you're wearing. What you feel like. Just what's it like to be you in that safe place with the Lord. So hopefully now, in that safe place with him, I want you to ask him a question. I want you to ask him to take you somewhere. It could be a place, it could be a period, it could be a time, it could be a moment. And trust that he's going to take you into a place where he will keep you safe. So now you can acknowledge what the situation is. Is it an event, a conversation, an argument, a classroom, the boss's office? And as you find yourself in that place, he's right there with you, but where is he? Notice where Jesus is in that space. Notice how you sense his presence
Notice how maybe you don't. And now you can turn to him and tell him exactly what you're experiencing. And be raw, be honest. What does he say to you? How does he respond? Remember that Jesus gives shalom peace, the peace to be made whole to be restored. I want you to check in with Jesus and Wherever you are, in that place, in that event, in that time, just tell them how you're feeling now. Express to him your gratitude for his presence with you, whether you Experience it or not, because we trust by faith that he's there. And having thanked him, I want to slowly bring you back to Dempsey Hall. We can pray together. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, to the Holy Spirit. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right. Who went on a trip with Jesus? Okay, good. Did it make some sense? Did Jesus, I'm not going to ask for anyone to share anything, but you can just nod or shake your head. Did Jesus bring some clarity to a situation that you might have been in at some point and like not understood? Okay. That's beautiful. So, what I just led you through was called an Emmanuel moment. So it was meeting up with Jesus. What did I just do? Meeting up with Jesus in a safe place and going there with him and acknowledging that he'll never take you somewhere that he won't protect you and lead you and guide you and letting him shed his light on perhaps a moment or an experience that maybe you never saw his light because it was so painful or so difficult, right? It's one method of inner healing. There are a bunch. Um, these are resources. If you find yourself interested in this and in entering maybe more deeply into particular experiences or memories or like even just whatever it is, um, these books are really good. So Unbound kind of breaks open those five steps that I talked about. Abba's Heart, I've recommended before, I know for a fact. Um, that one's so good because it gets you in tune with the heart of the Father and with the heart of his voice. Um, Be Healed by Dr. Bob Schutz, 
is quickly becoming like a major spiritual classic. Um, it's a killer read and really helps to understand how God can help us get into the roots of some of our discomfort with our inner self and shed light on that. Loved as I Am is just a beautiful little book by Sister Miriam James Highland. Uh, it really helps get to the heart of our identity as beloved sons and daughters. Um, and then prayer ministry. If you found this period of prayer to be helpful, or you know someone who you think could experience great freedom from something like that, um, there's a group called Peter Shadow out of um, Akron who I work a lot with, um, and they are very, 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 very well steeped in this stuff, um, as well as in physical healing and all kinds of other stuff. And you'll get to meet some of them uh, in a couple months. Um, but then myself as well, I'm pretty trained in a lot of this. So if you find that you just need a conversation or want to be guided along a path with some of this stuff, you can reach out to me at any time as well. So those are your resources. And then the remaining sessions. So <clears throat> there are six main sessions for this program. Um, all of them except all of these except for April 20th are part of it still. February 16th is going to be the power of intercession. Uh, my sister's going to come in from Columbus to do that night. And she's, if you were at the concert, she was the one who sang. Um, she's just really, really legit. So tell all your friends. That's going to be a great night. Um, March 20th is the power of testimony. Um, so we talked about the power of our story and talking to Jesus or talking about our relationship with Jesus. Um, my buddy Deacon Ian Kelly is going to come in to talk about that. Uh, he's going to be ordained a priest in May, God willing, so pray for him. Um, skip over April for a second. May 18th, that will be our final session, and we're going to talk about Jesus' mission statement. So I kind of alluded to that a little bit tonight, but we're going to talk about the mission statement of Jesus and how our lives and our gifts and our talents and abilities fit into that statement. So where in the whole, like, go and proclaim the gospel do your particular gifts and talents fit in? And how is he calling you to go on mission? Um, and we'll actually write our own mission statement that night so that having gone through this whole series, we'll be able to look back and say, this is where God was leading me through all of those sessions so that I can go out. And then backtrack to April 20th. Um, there is a group, basically an international group now, called Encounter Ministries, and they are quasi, they're charismatic, um, but they get into all of this stuff, inner healing, physical healing, gifts of the Holy Spirit, everything from start to finish. And um, we have an encounter, they have a school of ministry um, down in Akron, and we're going to have them out here April 20th at 7, or 6 p.m., I believe, in the church, and they're going to put on what's called a transformation night. That's going to consist of some praise and worship music, kind of like the stuff my siblings and I did. Um, I'm going to give a talk. It's probably going to be on identity, similar to the first of our series, but we're going to just like blast this to the entire parish and like neighboring parishes and just try to fill the church. Um, so music, talk, and then the last hour, the third hour, will be healing. So inner healing, physical healing. So you tell all your sick friends who need God's help. Um, we're going to have healing teams that night who are going to show up and pray and heal and do their thing. So that's going to be a really, really cool night. And the reason we're doing this the way we are is because I want you to experience that night, that transformation night, so that when we come together to write about Jesus' mission statement and how our own fits into that, we've seen the kingdom of God at hand. We've seen God's hand at work among us, and we're, like, ready to go to do our part. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. Um, yes. March 20th is a Monday. Mm. I just want to clarify. Yeah, March 20th is a Monday. Yeah, I don't know why I did that. It's March 16th. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I I think I was probably thinking April. There you go, March 16th, not March 20th. All right, any questions about anything this evening? Yeah. OK, 
Okay, so I'm thinking to myself, we came here to learn about uh, evangelization. And uh, I'm not, I'm not seeing it yet, <laughs> especially with all this coming up. So the kingdom of God is a hand, right? Evangelization is introducing people to the person of Jesus. The person of Jesus came down to earth to heal, to restore the relationship between God and man. And the way in which he did that was by performing miracles to show us that God was legit, that God was real, and that he was living among us. And so our job as Christians is to live within those same miracles, that same encounter, and then share that with everybody whom we encounter. But the only way we can share it is if we first receive it ourselves. And can't, so... You can't give what you don't have. Right. Okay. That was a good question because I meant to say that. And didn't. Thank you. Gramps always looking out for you. <laughs> and Grandma. I had a question because that last session you took us through where we went somewhere with Jesus, um, I went someplace really beautiful. Was it supposed to be um, not? Tragic? Yeah. No. Oh. No. So the question was, she went somewhere really awesome with Jesus. Was she supposed to go somewhere bad? No. Well, wherever the Holy Spirit took you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was wondering if that would happen, and it did. <laughs> so if you went to, like, your 16th birthday party and it was the greatest day of your life, Rock on. <laughs> yeah. Um, so February and March will be seven o'clock. Yes. Yeah, April twentieth will be six, I believe. There will be more details on that to come. Yeah. Yeah. We're still finalizing all that with Encounter. Good. Amen. Okay. The Lord be with you. And with your May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Thank you. I'll be up here for questions if there's anything.